So, okay. So, basic motivations. Hunger, thirst, pain. Pain is not regulated by the hypothalamus. That's a different circuit. Anger slash aggression. Thermal regulation. Panic and escape. Affiliation and care. Sexual desire. Exploration. Play. And you can kind of break those in. You can kind of break those into uh, the classic Darwinian categories too and say, well, there's a set of motivations that go along with self-maintenance. That would be your survival. Ingestive and defensive. See, I've sort of coded them there, so the, the self-maintenance, there's an ingestive set of basic motivations that go with self-maintenance, you say that's hunger, thirst, there's a set of defensive motivations, pain, anger, thermal regulation, panic and escape, and then there's, there's motivations that are associated with reproduction, affiliation, care, and sexual desire, and then I put exploration in place sort of outside of that, uh, I would say because those two things serve both of these approximately equally so what I tried to do is take the basic motivations and then nest them inside a fundamental Darwinian framework so that you could see how the biological process of evolution has manifested itself and then sort of differentiated into these fundamental, fun, fundamental biological systems so well you've got your eating and drinking system, your reproductive system and your defensive system but the problem is is that those things, first of all, can conflict, you know, are you too hungry to sleep or too sleepy to eat? So that's a pretty simple kind of contradiction, you know, are you more angry at your partner or do you want sexual relations more? So there's, and so they can conflict in the present, but then they can conflict with other people doing the same thing, and they can conflict across time. And so partly the reason that you need the rest of your brain is to solve the problems that emerge from the solutions that the hypothalamus offers and so because you don't want to just eat and drink and reproduce and, and, and defend yourself you want to eat now, later, tomorrow, next week and next month while you're able to engage in reproductive activity and defend yourself in multiple contexts with a whole bunch of people for as long as you can possibly manage it and so you need the rest of your brain to calculate that and so what the rest of your brain has to do, roughly speaking, is regulate these and also elaborate them up into like, like into something that's integrated inside you, which might roughly be your personality, and then so that that personality is integrated with the personality of other people and so you can think about it as an emergent process this is one of the things I really like about Piaget he's so damn smart, because Piaget is the only thinker I know, really who really addressed the problem of the evolution of value systems, like he never nailed it down to the physiology, because there wasn't enough known about physiology when he did his work but it maps really nicely onto the physiology, alright, so, so that's sort of a physiological look at it, this is more of a conceptual look at it, so I said that each of these systems you can think about in a bunch of different ways, you can think about it as something that sets a goal, I'm, I'm hungry and I don't want to be hungry, point A, point B, so the hunger and the vision of the satiation of the hunger are all part of the same frame and so, if you're hungry, you go into the kitchen you know that already, that's part of your procedural knowledge about how the world works and then what you're going to look for are only those things that are relevant to what you're trying to do in the kitchen everything else is zeroed out, you won't even really see it, and why would you? you want to see the things that are relevant to the task at hand so anyways, you've got this little frame you're somewhere, and it's not good enough, and you're going somewhere else that's going to be better and what better depends upon is the state of these underlying biological systems and then more complexly, as those biological systems get integrated into a personality and into the social world then the, the frame and the goal is going to be dependent on that more complex hierarchical organization so you're not in here because you're hungry you're in here because if you get a degree, maybe you don't ever have to be hungry so, so the hunger is properly incorporated into your you don't want to be cold, you don't want to freeze to death in the winter, you don't want to be on the street you know, so your higher order goals are long term socially negotiated solutions to the problems that are implicit in your being, that, that might be one way of thinking about it so, so and the micro elements of this, so you could say I'm hungry, that's a physiological state and a conception I have a vision of how I'm going to solve that 
but then, and those are, that's an abstraction but what you do to transform point A into point B is not an abstraction you act you know, so if you're hungry, you actually move your body say down from the second floor into the kitchen and you arrange things so that there's transformations in the world and that's a good way of thinking about the relationship between the mind and the body your hypothetical solution to your problem that's the mind but the manner in which you incarnate that solution that's no longer abstract so actually when you describe the operation of one of these things that's when you're telling a story so I was somewhere I needed something I went and got it it's a boring little story but that's the basic unit of a story right because I don't care to hear what you're doing unless you had a reason for doing it so I just say what's the point of the story and the point of the story is the point it's directional right it says I went from here to there that's the point here's how I did it that's the point and you're interested in that because maybe you want to know how to do it too and you won't have to struggle through it like I did you could just listen and so we're always throwing these little units of information back and forth to each other and for good reason, I, I want to know what your point is because better I learn it from you than make all the mistakes that you had to make when you were learning it and human beings, we've, we got that figured out, that's for sure so okay, so now here's another way of thinking about this and this is a more abstract way of thinking about it so we talked about the idea that the world might be divided into tools and, and um, and obstacles and irrelevant things most of which, and irrelevant things, that's a huge category and it's the one you don't want to have disrupted and also that the obstacle category produces more emotion than the tool category it's that unpredicted outcome makes the irrelevant relevant and it produces an undifferentiated emotional and motivational state it's a better way of thinking about it because it isn't just that you, you don't just get anxious for example if something goes wrong you get anxious, you get angry, you get curious you get frustrated, you get depressed like it's a whole bursting forward of emotions and motivational states so promise produces hope slash pleasure curiosity all the incentive reward related emotions sort of fit in that box and then undesired outcomes produce threat they're threats and they produce anxiety so we're concentrating now on the unpredicted outcome or the undesired outcome because we said, well that's like a portal, right? It, it's a portal through which doubt can pour and it's the thing that makes the irrelevant relevant again and so that's why I use this little diagram it's like, oh oh, that's a, that's a fear face, roughly speaking and I put all those stripes on it to indicate that it's not just fear, it's preparation for all sorts of different for all sorts of different perceptions and all sorts of different motivational states so you're moving from point A to point B and you're using your actions, your known actions to get there okay and what happens? You, you run into an anomaly and it's like a hole it's a hole through the map it's like a hole is burned in it or something like that and the map's no longer relevant and so what happens? while your positive emotion systems are activated or disinhibited that's a better way of thinking about it and your negative emotion systems are disinhibited and what might those be? well, in positive emotion you have hope and interest and exhilaration and curiosity and confidence and in the negative emotional space you have anxiety and fear and hurt and anger and guilt and shame and disappointment and disgust like there's quite a stacking of emotions and you don't know which of those is going to be useful and relevant and so it all emerges at the same time so down you are in chaos right and so that's part of the classic human story the classic human story is I was going from point A to point B and I wanted to get to point B and here's how I did it but then along the way something popped up unexpectedly and stopped me and it threw me for a loop we're trying to map the geography onto, the, onto, the ab, onto something that's more abstract and comprehensive and, and, and we do that using conceptual schemes that we evolved over vast spans of time and have just moved up one level of abstraction known territory or what's explored unknown territory or what's not explored the trans transformation or the dissolution of one into the other and then the reconstitution of that that's what an election does, right? it's like, okay, we have our leader who's the person at the top of the dominance hierarchy and defines the nature of this particular structure there's an election 
It's regulated chaos. No one knows what's going to happen. It's the death of the old king. Bang! We go into a chaotic state. Everyone argues for a while. And then out of that argument, they produce a consensus and poof, we're in a new state. Right? That's the meta story, right?